We're back with my guest, Dr. Colin Ross from the Ross Institute for Psychological Trauma. Uh, Dr. Ross and I have been talking about the history of mind control experimentation in the United States, and uh, we're going to get right back to Dr. Ross here. So, um, uh, Dr. Ross, let's talk a little bit, uh, like we talked about at the break, about Tuskegee and uh, uh, some of the other earlier experiments, just so we can give some people an idea of, uh, of how deeply uh, this goes back into history. Okay. And I'll comment on the old conspiracy of silence bit there, too. Now, I was in medical school from 1977 to 1981. Okay. And the Tuskegee syphilis study ran from 1942 to 1972. So it stopped five years before I started medical school, and I never heard about it till the 1990s. Wow. So what was the Tuskegee syphilis study, and what has it got to do with mind control? It directly doesn't have anything to do with mind control. What it's got to do with is the broad picture of medical ethics and medical experiments and the absolutely outrageous stuff that went on that you would think was impossible but was actually published in medical journals. So the Tuskegee syphilis study was actually a repeat of an experiment that was done in Norway back around 1919 or so. And what they did was, and now you, you'll, you won't have much trouble figuring out why they chose the subjects they chose. Right. They didn't choose daughters of corporate CEOs. They didn't choose wives of congressmen and senators. They chose uh, 400 black, rural, illiterate, poor guys in the South, all of whom had active syphilis. And then there was 400 controls in Alabama who didn't have syphilis. And what they did is they prevented the 400 guys with syphilis from having treatment all the way up till 1972. And they, uh, there was a, a nurse whose name was Eunice Rivers, I think it was, if I remember her name right. Mm -hmm. She actually got an award for being the study nurse from the U.S. Public Health Service. The Tuskegee syphilis study was approved by and known to and signed off on by American Heart Association, uh, Surgeon General, uh, and many different medical societies and organizations. And at 25-year point of the study, the Surgeon General signed an individual certificate for each surviving subject in the study, and they were given $25, $1 for each year of participation in the study. $1 for each year? Right. For and participation, which many times they didn't even know they were participating. They thought that the book about this is called Bad Blood. Mm -hmm. They thought that they had bad blood. They had no idea that it was an infectious disease. Right, that's what they were told. You have bad blood. And right. so... Now, that in itself is just an incredible, unbelievable violation of medical ethics because these people could have been treated with early, somewhat effective treatments in the 40s, but when, by the time penicillin came on, these people could have been treated and cured. Right. So what was the outcome of the study? Well, of course, these people died earlier, had more diseases, and got sicker than the guys without syphilis. And uh, the reason I know that's what happened is Again, not because I talked to some deep throat character, because I went to the medical school library and got the paper from the journal, which has got, I don't remember the exact title, but it's something like Untreated Syphilis in the Male Negro, a 20-Year Follow-Up. Amazing. Published in a mainstream medical journal. So yeah. all the doctors who read that journal, the editors, it was a generally publicly known fact that this was going on. The medical profession just looked the other way. So it's outrageous that these guys, as adult males, had untreated syphilis. But I actually read the whole book before it occurred to me, wait a minute. This study went on for 30 years. There's 400 guys. How many different women did they have intercourse with during right. that 30 years? My gosh. How many women did they impregnate? And how many, how children? many children were born with congenital syphilis? And what was the purpose of the experiment? What did we find out from this experiment? We found out that if you have syphilis and you don't treat it, you get sicker and you die earlier. Amazing. Which is, we already knew that. Mm. There's no real medical purpose for it, and it obviously violates every possible medical ethic going back for thousands of years. Yeah, it, it, it is uh, as many times, as, as thoroughly as I know it now, it's still uh, talking to you tonight. Uh, it's just a mind bender for me all over again. It is. And, uh, and, then, and then the question comes, well, why did it stop in 1972? 
because one guy who was working at a, a VD clinic in San Francisco thought to himself, he started hearing stories about this Tuskegee syphilis study. Mm-hmm. And he thought to himself, wait a minute here. He contacted the Center for Disease Control, which had taken over and was running the study at this time. Ongoing, right. They brought him down there. They met with him. They said, oh, it's all okay. We're doctors. This is medical study. <laughs> he went back and basically he called a journalist friend who blew the thing in the uh, Washington Post. There was a big article. And all of a sudden, all the medical people like were outraged, backpedaled, right. distanced right. themselves from it, and it was shut down. Right. I've read the actual article, and you're exactly right. All of a sudden, it was an outrage in the community. But where were they when it was actually going on? It's unreal. And so that's uh, really the same story as the radiation experiments. Mm-hmm. The radiation and uh, biological and chemical weapons ex- experiments. Clinton set up a, a commission of inquiry, basically, that produced a report, I forget the exact year, probably around 96, 97, somewhere in there. Mm-hmm. It's a 900-page document that I have. And it was uh, going back to the Second World War, you know those famous pictures of all the soldiers watching the nuclear bomb go off in the South Pacific. Right. It goes all the way back to that and follows forward. And uh, again, I have uh, articles from medical journals where they're describing uh, this, I think it was in Connecticut. It was in the Northeast somewhere. Mm -hmm. Um, There's a home for mentally retarded kids, kind of a care facility for mentally retarded kids. And they're giving these kids uh, viruses, bacteria, and radiation experimentally. They're putting radioactive substances in their cereal <laughs> and telling the parents that it's a dietary supplement. So they're directly lying to the parents. Mm-hmm. And it's all just for the purpose of finding out what happens when a bunch of radiation gets in your body. Right. How fast does it come out in your urine? What does it do to you? How long does it stay in the bones? Which is unethical by itself. Then lying to the parents is obviously unethical. Right. But it all gets published in a journal. That's crazy. And so I've got articles where they're describing uh, injecting people with viruses, mm-hmm. mentally retarded kids, just to see what happens. Right. And again, it just goes on without comment. And at the bottom of the article, it'll say, uh, "Funded by U.S. Department of the Army." So you know that the Army is not funding this because they're trying to help patients or advance medicine. Right. It's about biological warfare right, and wars. how to protect troops against biological warfare from the other side. Right, right. Which, which in essence, is an extension of much of what the Germans were doing uh, who ended up uh, here after, uh, uh, through paperclip. Right. Was, uh, like you say, offensive weapons and then defenses against those same weapons. And the, the, the radiation, the people who were involved in, like the Atomic Energy Commission obviously is involved in the radiation. Mm-hmm. But the, you find that the Atomic Energy Commission is also cross-linked to the U.S. Public Health Service because as soon as you've got radiation, you've got a health issue. Sure. Then the U.S. Public Health Service is next-door neighbor of the Center for Disease Control. So then the Center of Disease Control, U.S. Public Health Service, those are all arms of the government. Well, so is the military. So is the CIA. Right. And all, you find a lot of cross-linking in terms of the actual people running the experiments. Mm-hmm the bodies funding the experiments, the journals publishing the experiments. So the mind control experimentation is all interwoven with the radiation, chemical, biological weapons. An example is a guy named William Sweet, who was a neurosurgeon at Harvard. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's quoted uh, in testimony at the, whatever the name of the committee was, the Advisory Committee on Human Radiation, I think it was called, right. the Clinton setup. He's quoted as saying, well, yes, we did do radiation experiments on Harvard using plutonium, and we injected plutonium into people, but they all gave informed consent. Well, the little problem is uh, HP4, which is the code name for one of the subjects, right. means human product number four. So he was the fourth subject in the experiment. HP4, that's what it was called? Yeah, I'm pretty sure HP4. Okay. Human I'm product right. number four. Hmm. Yeah. That's not the, exactly that's friendly terminology. Yeah. So the, he comes into the emergency department at one of the Harvard hospitals. He's injected with plutonium. He, uh, he, this is one of the guys who supposedly gave informed consent. Right. But he came in unconscious in a coma as a John Doe. He was never identified. He was injected with plutonium, and he died 
without coming out of the coma and without being identified. Right, and somehow so throughout that... informed consent. Yeah, somehow he gave conform, uh, informed consent throughout that whole thing. So it's just lying. Right. Well, hey, that, that, uh, that, that, that brings a question to mind. So I just well, want to... Let me fill in one more little oh, bit. Okay, go ahead. Because it's the cross-link to mind control. All right, great. So this same guy, William Sweet, was also in the Harvard brain electrode implant team. So there was brain electrode ex implant experiments done uh, for sure at Tulane, Yale, and Harvard. And these guys, again, published all this in medical journals. As early as when? Uh, yeah, back into the early 50s. 